Hello, everybody. This is Linus Wilson. You will hear from Ariana, the creator of the YouTube channel Sailing Mischief, about how she lost her boat, how they evacuated from St. Martin after Hurricane Irma hit, and how Ariana's boyfriend and his best friend were stranded after Hurricane Maria when they helped out another boater. This interview was originally recorded for the Slow Boat Sailing podcast, but we're making Making it available for YouTube listeners as they prepare for Hurricane Florence. Might give you some ideas about the perils of tying up in a uh, marina that is in the eye of a major hurricane. And it might give you the, some ideas how to be better prepared in case the worst case scenario happens. Okay, here's my complete interview with Ariana of Sailing Mischief. So, are you in Florida right now? Is that right? But my boyfriend Christian and Kyler are still in Puerto Rico. Tyler, you said, is uh, the other person in Puerto Rico? Yeah, uh, that's his best friend, Kyler, with a K. It's like Tyler, oh. but Kyler. Kyler, okay. So Kyler and Christian are still in Puerto Rico. Correct. It was what I saw in the movie. Have you had much contact with them since uh, you departed Puerto Rico? Um, I once I left Puerto Rico, it was still about a week before Maria had hit. So I was talking to them right before then. Um, once Maria hit, I had not talked to them about four days afterwards. Then they were able to call me on Wi-Fi for about 15 minutes. And then from there, it was another three days. And last night was the first night that I actually talked to them on a phone. And that was through the, uh, the place where they're staying. The people that they're staying with neighbor has a phone that works sometimes so oh, wow yeah it's, it's kind of and, and they said it's, it's getting to get really bad there like about an about two hours like normal drive like if there was no issues to get to san juan where they're at so with the issues they said it would take them several hours and it, they would probably have to walk partially there as well so it would even maybe even take them a whole day to almost two days so to get to where the relief is in near San Juan is almost like not really practical for them currently. Yikes! Do yeah. they do they have water, electricity? Um, they said that the their water and food supplies is going down, um, which is not so lovely. Um, but they do have a generator, and um, the people that they're staying with have a generator, but there's also hardly any gas. So they run the generator for, like, two hours a day or whatever it is just so they can, you know, cook food and uh, charge their, you know, phones if hopefully in the hope that they're going to get some sort of service eventually. Oh, okay. Yeah, they said it was getting kind of prickly down there as well. A lot of uh, the crime's not uh, is a bit kind of not so good. A lot of people are looting and things like that, which you kind of tend to see in cases like this. Do they have any plans to go back to the U.S., or to, is that um, possible? The current, hopefully, is what they're by, like, it's called Anaguila, I can't really pronounce it right, airport. They're closer to the airport that's, uh, like, on the other side of the island. We have them booked for flights home on the 17th of October. That's the soonest the flight that we can get booked is the 17th of October. And, you know, it's only, it's the 29th, so there, it's going to be several days in that, and so hopefully we're hoping that um, we might see some more progress with that, because they are they are about a five-hour walk from the other airport, but the other, all the airports are, you know, really badly damaged, and there's hardly any flights going in and out. They said that they, uh, yesterday, airplanes did land on the tarmac, but they were just taking out, you know, the sick elderly who needed to get out there immediately. It's, it's good to hear, though. We have um, the one thing that's been really nice, though, is I don't know if you've ever heard of Spot. I know they're kind of more common on like for they're used for like uh, people on sailboats or on hikes. It's like a satellite, uh, it's not a cell phone, but it tracks your location through a satellite. And they have like two buttons one says, like, I'm okay, I'm safe, and like the other one's like, help me type deal. And it tracks through the satellite. So they have that but there's no way to like respond back to them or anything. So it's just like we have like every day we get like, we're okay. We'll contact you as soon as we get, if we can type deal. 
and you know so it, it it's been nice to see that so we can actually see their pinpoint of the like the location i can be watching them where they're at you christian and kyler were on a boat in saint martin and maybe you could take us back to uh, what happened in St. Martin and why uh, Christian and Kyler and you went to San Juan. Um, so it started, me and Christian started our sailing journey down in Grenada. We bought a boat and we wanted to sail the Caribbean. We figured that we, you know, we knew the risk of sailing during hurricane season, but in the last several hurricane seasons, they haven't really been that bad. So we thought we'll be fine. You know, we you know, we're just going to go for it. We had made it all the way up to um, about Antigua, and then our motor on our sailboat stopped working, which I know it's a sailboat, so it's not, you know, the end of the world. But the part that we needed was in St. Martin. So we decided that we were going to sail the sail over to St. Martin. So once we got to St. Martin, it was still, uh, we had the update that um, Irma was coming. But it was only like a, it was still like a tropical storm when we had arrived in St. Martin. And so we didn't think much of it. Within that like two to three days that we were there, it had jumped from a tropical storm to a category three hurricane. Um, so we were like, okay, what should we do? Uh, the, at that time, it was forecasted to hit the Virgin Islands as well and the lower islands. So we felt like, okay, we don't. To go up is not that safe. To go down is not that safe. Like, if we went down, we were going to have to sail all the way back down, and we didn't have um, the part to our motor still. So we were kind of risking trying to sail all that way back down, downwind, you know, that entire time against it. And so we, fi we figured we were better off kind of buggering down and getting into a marina versus, you know, fighting the wind on the way back with no motor. So... I I had contemplated back and forth if we should fly out. My Our parents were kind of starting to get worried for us. They were like, maybe you guys should fly out. We were kind of like, we'll be okay. And Kyler, his Christ, Kyler is Christian's best friend since uh, they were kids, young kids. He had already been planning to come and visit us on like a week after this. Like it had been on, like we had planned for him to fly down like a month before all of this had happened. Well, Kyler ended up said, well, do you guys need help getting the boat ready? I'd be more than happy to come down and help you guys and get this boat kind of figured out. Um, and we're like, yes, we could definitely do it. You know, this is, was our first real, like, you know, kind of bunkering down for a hurricane and that kind of situation. So he flew in two days before Irma was supposed to hit. He kind of helped us get everything ready. We originally had the plan where we were staying. It was at the Island Waterworld Marina. Uh, we had planned that we were going to, uh, at first they said uh, they were going to let us stay actually in the building during during the hurricane. But once it had upgraded to a five, they're like, no, you guys you guys cannot stay in, in this building. So we had to scramble and find a hotel. And so we pretty much figured out where we could stay. We had booked through actually hotels.com. And once we got to a hotel, they actually said, we have no reservation for you guys. And this was like the day before. This is on Monday. And Irma hit like Tuesday early morning. And so we were scrambling to find even a hotel. And all the hotels had been booked, like completely booked. Like we went to six different hotels, like door to door at all capacity were full. And we finally found um, Alegria, which was right next to Moho Beach, the, the famous beach right there. And luckily they, they had, they let us take a room and we were so happy about that. But we had brought, cause we were spent, we just spent all day like in a taxi pretty much trying to ride around, figuring out where we could go. We had all our stuff, as much stuff that we could bring off the boat with us. Still in the hopes that, that mischief would be floating when we got that, but that didn't happen as planned either. So we ended up in the hotel for most of the hurricane and we were in, the Alegria from we stayed the night we got there Monday we got evacuated out of Puerto R I mean out of St. Martin to Puerto Rico on that Sunday so we still had several days after where it was complete devastation and it was it was very intense like during the hurricane we were in this uh, beautiful green newly mob remodeled hotel um, big like concrete and you could just feel the entire building just shaking completely shaking and we were on the fourth floor and there was a, a one floor above us it was a five floor hotel the the floor above us the roof came off 
and the um, sliding glass doors and door had completely ripped off and went all the way through. So we were getting just buckets of water coming in through the ceiling. Like we had about like three to four inches of water at our feet during the entire time. And you could just, it just sounded like things were breaking and crashing. Like there was a, like a big train was driving, you know, right next to the building it, it seemed like. And what was so surreal as well is like we were able since, Irma went right over St. Martin that we got to walk out during the eye of the storm. And I think that was one of the most eerie things I've ever experienced in my life. Um, it's just completely calm and there's, you know what I mean? It's just quiet. And, you know, after we've gone through hours, you're just hearing like banging and like crazy noises to hear, hearing just almost like silence. And that was, that lasted about 45 minutes. And then the wind started picking up again. And then with the hurricane, you know, it, it is doing a whole rotation. So we were getting the one on the first, when it first hit us, you're getting the wind from one direction. So all the roofing's coming off on one end. And then when it, it came around the second time, once the eye had passed over, now the wind shifted and it's coming from the other side. So now you're getting all the debris from the other way. So it, it was really, really, really intense. And then after we had made it, through all of that, we were able to go see the boat and kind of walk around, and it it was it was very sad. It it was like everything was completely destroyed. There was boats in the middle of the road. There was I would say if you were I would say like one in every hundred boat had maybe survived it. Maybe like Saint Martin, it's completely devastated, and it, it was just bad. Like for the sailing community down there, it it was it was very sad. Like it didn't matter if you went did the precautions of trying to go on the on the hard or anything like that. Like almost every single boat was completely devastated or had some sort of damage. You know, masses snapped, hole, holes in the hull. Like it it was bad. How long were you at the hotel? We were at the hotel, so we had we put, checked in on Monday. We didn't. We left on Sunday. The one thing that we were very lucky where our hotel was in the location we were at. Since we were right by Moho Beach, we literally had a visual of the the hotel completely the entire time. I mean, not the, of the hotel, the airport. I'm so sorry, the airport. So we were be able to watch when, like, when the first airplane landed on the strip and things like that. Um, we were able to see all of that happening, you know, right there. So we were, we could, you know, we walked, we walked to the to the airport one day, and we had still people. Our hotel was completely. The managers were very nice. Uh, um, they let a lot of their staff stay in the hotel as well with us, like uh, throughout the building. And so we had a, we met so many locals, so many people who had worked there. Even um, there was only probably a couple of, uh, I guess, tourists as well there. But they did an amazing job overall. I thought they, you know, they were they still fed us. Our hotel, our generator did did last pretty good so they would turn the generator on for like the, the couple hours a day just so you could charge whatever devices you need to charge and their staff there actually did a lot of cooking we were very lucky as well in the fact that we were right next to um it's called sunset grill i want to say it's a bar comp right adjacent to the hotel and they had just got a shipment of food so we were able to uh they were cooking the food from the restaurant so we, we still had a decent amount of food and supplies before the hurricane hit. We are from Florida, so I feel like we had a little bit of a hurricane ment mentality prepness. We had went and bought like 15 um, five-liter jugs of fresh water. So we, were, we, we did very good on water, but it was almost out by the time we left. Um, when we got evacuated, we had friends that got evacuated. We got evacuated on Sunday, and some of the people that were staying at the hotel got evacuated on the following Monday. And they had told us, though, that that day uh, the, the generator caught fire on that Monday, so the generator was not going to be working anymore. And that then all of a sudden the sewage was starting to really back up after that point. So we were – we overall, the timing that we had, we were very – lucky to get out when we did because it was only getting worse and you could feel though day by day the host like the environment of people you know what I mean at the, at, after the hurricane happened everyone was you know you're just happy that everyone lived like we were 
the whole, I would say 50% of the, the hotel or more was completely damaged. So everyone in our hotel was alive. So, you know, you felt that like relief. Everyone immediately after the hurricane was like, you know, very like happy and came together type deal. But as the days kind of went on and no one had still been evacuated yet, you could feel the tension though, like rising, you know, you could feel, feel that pressure of like, okay, the, you know, we're not, you know, right afterwards we were getting these huge plates of food, you know, and by the end of it, you know, the smaller and smaller amount of food, you know what I mean? It kind of just started to dwindle. So I, I really cannot imagine how, how they are doing now. Um, and I feel so bad because now news has completely shifted from St. Martin and Antigua and all those other islands to Puerto Rico, which I'm not saying, yes, Puerto Rico needs just as much help too. But I also feel so bad because St. Martin there, you know, it's going to take them several years as well to rebound from that. And we had met some amazing people and lifelong friends that, that, you know, they're, they're, they're from St. Martin and their house was completely devastated and they're going to be living in a hotel in that hotel for weeks until they can get back on their feet or whatever they can. And that hotel is not really that livable currently. Like the, our bed, we had to sleep on, like everything was just soaking wet because everything's, you know, coming from, it was completely, the water was coming in from the ceilings. So the bed was wet. Everything was just damp constantly. And then you couldn't take a shower, which was also, uh, to be in your filth is not such a lovely thing at all. So our first shower that we took felt like absolutely heaven. So I just can't imagine how they still are and how things are still happening. So I really hope that people can still remember like St. Martin and everything, but still keep a light on Puerto Rico. There's just been so much damage with these last couple of hurricanes. Okay. When did you visit uh, Mischief for the first time after Hurricane Irma? We had to visit her uh, the following day, so it was on Wednesday. We ha were able to go and see Mischief. Um, we hitched a ride. We had walked as far as we could, and then someone had was driving in that direction. So we we're like, "Please, can we can we get a ride with you?" And they said, "Sure." So we were lucky enough. We were pretty far away from her, though. Uh, it was probably about like a twenty to th twenty twenty five minute drive to Mischief. So if we would have walked that, I think it would have taken us at least a couple of hours. Um, so we were lucky that someone was, uh, was willing to drive us over there. Once we had gotten over there and uh, saw Mischief, she, uh, we were walking out because um, it was the, it's a budget marine is like in front and then you walk out behind is where the docks are. Hold on, if you give me one second, let me, when you walked out, we walked out to the, the boats. And you just, Mischief wasn't even there. Like, you couldn't see her. And my, like, first reaction was, I, I literally just stopped. And I sat down where I was. And you just get all these waves of emotions because we put, you put so much time and effort and love into something. Um, we had just, you know, got the boat in, in January. We had, you know, re, you know, put her on the heart, repainted the hall. You know, you just put so much time and effort, you know, and this is your home. Someone had made the comment to, uh, to me that don't worry guys it's it's just a boat it's not your it's not like you lost your home and I was like no it is we lost our home I was like this is I we live on this you I mean this is what we've been doing for the last eight months this is our life this is what we put so much of our effort and passion into for the last eight months and then to tell me that it's it doesn't matter and I think a lot of people don't see that because if you're not in the boating world you don't understand in a way, you know, living aboard a boat is a little bit different than, you know, just having your weekend trip out on a boat. You know, you, it's your home, you know, just as much as you love your house, you know, we loved mischief just as much as that way, you know, our valuables, we still lost a lot of things. And especially during, in a situation like this, your head's not thinking straight. There are so many things that I left on the boat that I wish I didn't. But, you know, we didn't think that she was going to be underwater when we got back to her. We thought we were going to be at least coming back to a floating boat. Like, we were definitely under the impression that, okay, she's going to have some damages. You know, maybe the mast snapped or something. But we didn't think the severity that she was that she was in. 
but she she was completely submerged underwater. Uh, there was a couple of, like console boats in front of us, like motor boats, right in front of us where we were at the marina, and one of the boats had completely flipped right on top of her. So she was completely submerged underwater, though her mast was snapped as well. Though the cleats in the like the cement um, were completely ripped out of the cement. The cleats in the cement where we had tied down completely ripped out. The pilings were completely ripped out, which also I think is so crazy. Um, one of the staff members did stay at Island Waterworld, and he said he went and checked on the boats during the eye of the storm. And he said that all the boats that were in that marina were still tied down. They had shifted a little bit, but all the boats were still floating, and they were okay. He said it was the second half that completely just wiped everything out. Um, we had one of the locals told us that he clocked a gust of 252 mile per hour winds. So, it, it, you know, there, there's that's not a hurricane, you know what I mean? That's like worst hurricane ever in history, you know what I mean? We never thought we would be put in a situation where we were in the worst hurricane in history, you know what I mean? The night before, we kept like turning the TV on and I would get, you know, flustered because I, I would turn the TV on and I'd be watching... You know, they're updating saying, you know, this is a textbook, textbook hurricane. And this is, you know, we've never seen this eye is completely perfect. And, you know, I would get all anxious and I would have to turn the TV off because I would be getting so nervous. And then, you know, 20 minutes would pass and I'd be like, I need to turn the TV back on because I need to know what's going on. So, you know, you're, it was just like this constant thing of, you know, people are saying this is going to be the worst one in history. It's about to hit you. And you just don't think you're going to be in that. You know, you, we thought hurricanes were possible, but we never thought it was going to be that intense it was just completely crazy and it's just still devastating to see our our boat completely gone we do want to go back there that was kind of the reason why the boys stayed in puerto rico i needed to fly home just because it does do a lot i personally for me on your like psyche or your mental state it's a lot to go through and i i really wanted to come back home to my my family and see them but the plan was i was going to fly back out to puerto rico in like two to three weeks and the boys were staying. One of our followers from YouTube had reached out to us and said that he had a boat and was willing. If you wanted to like help him, you know, spruce it up a little bit, we could sail down to St. Martin and check on our boat after everything had passed. So that's why the boys had stayed with, his name's Earl, and was helping on his boat. And I was going to fly back. And then we were going to sail down to St. Martin in weeks' time. But now that Maria has hit and completely devastated Puerto Rico, that completely shifts our plans as well now so not quite sure how did earl's boat do um actually it ended up pretty good i only talked to christian briefly about it they said they went and checked on it the boat came out like unscathed um they were in the mangroves but there was probably he said there was probably about 40 bo 40 boats in the mangroves and about 20 of them are completely ruined so he said that they were just, you know, I think in situations like this, especially in hurricanes, it's just by luck. You know what I mean? You can go and go extreme, you know, do everything you can in your power to make sure your boat is tied down. And personally, I think it's just all by luck. You know what I mean? It, it you, Everyone puts as much as they can into it. Um, the people next to us when we were in um, the marina in St. Martin, the guy had went and spent $1,000 the day before Irma had hit $1,000 on chafe guards, chains, ropes, lines, you know what I mean? All that. And his boat is completely devastated. You know what I mean? As well, like he, it's non salvageable. And so, you know, you can literally do everything that you can in your power to tie down your boat. And for me, yes, do those precautions a hundred percent, make sure it's done as much as you can. But after that, you know what I mean? I think you're just at the power, you know, at the mercy of mother nature. If, if it's going to end up destroyed or not, you know, because we don't really ever know if, if it's going to end up, if your boat does better than the guy next to you or not. What were some of the preparations you guys did in St. Martin? Um, well, the number one thing was we also, so we didn't have a motor, which was a big issue for us too. Um, so the way St. Martin is, I don't know if you've ever seen the layout of it. It has like the lagoon on the inside. It's quite a really big uh, sailing community down in St. Martin. Um, but the lagoons on the inside, we had been asking the officials when we first checked into St. Martin, we were like, so where, where do you go for a hurricane? Would you recommend that kind of thing? He's like, 
Well, number one thing, just get your boat inside the lagoon. So to get into the lagoon, there's like a drawbridge you have to go in. And then if you want to keep going further in, there's a second drawbridge. Well, that was also very hard for us because like I said before, we had no motor. So we had to use our dinghy and push our boat with our dinghy about four miles to this marina. A lot of the marinas also were completely taken as well. Um, we had first searched. We first, before deciding that we were going to move the boat in, we looked if there was any mangroves because generally mangroves are a little bit better. But in St. Martin, there isn't really that many in that area. And so then we decided, okay, we'll go into this marina. Well, that was a completely challenge in itself to get the boat into the marina. And once we did, um, we also, since we were staying at Island Waterworld, which is really nice, there was the store right there. We also went and bought um, chains, chafe guards, and a bunch of ropes. Uh, we had made friends with this guy named Jake who his boat was on the hard and he gave us extra fenders because he was going to need them. He gave us extra fenders and um, extra um, line as well. So we just tied down as much as we could. We put even, even when we were at the marina, we put out our anchor as far as we could. We dropped it as far out as we could and just put a bunch of fenders around and lines like everywhere. We had two pilings in the front of like, more like three pilings kind of in the front and we tied a chain down at the bottom and a line at the top so that would still give enough uh, for the storm surge because that's also another thing you have to take into account is you can't tie your lines down too tight because if you get you know a 10 foot storm surge it's just going to end up ripping the lines out so I feel like that was also a challenge as well on top of everything was just figuring out the dynamics of that especially that me and Christian hadn't ever done anything like this ever before either, this being our first time. We had a lot of help. The manager of the marina that we were at was very nice. Like she would, she was coming around to each boat and making sure that, you know, everyone was tying down correctly, that there was enough space in between each boat and, you know, which way was better to do it or not to do it. So that was extremely helpful as well, just to have other people who had gone through a this before and were able to direct us in the right way on how to do things. And what did you take off the boat? Um, well, we had brought, so we brought our generator because we thought that would be good to keep just in case because we had a little Honda 2000 generator. We had brought a generator with us. We had brought like a several, you know, a couple pairs of like clothing and that kind of things. We had, I brought all our safety gear. Um, that we had on the boat. So all our harnesses, like I had a life jacket harness for each of us, the three of us. I also brought, you know, all our like flashlights and things like that. And as well as I, we already had like a good amount of supplies of canned foods. Cause you know, on a filigone like boat, you have a lot of, you know, things like, like canned foods. So we brought pretty much our entire pantry with us because we just didn't know what to expect. You know, we didn't know if we were going to be able to just, you know, go walk back on mischief and sail away or if we were going to be stuck there for a while there's other things i wish i would have brought but we brought like since we do uh, the youtube channel i brought all my electronics you know in every every piece of electronic i could fit into my bag i did um that was like our biggest concern and then just water and that was pretty much the big like staple things that we had brought and our boat papers and that pretty much can't do anything else we just took everything off the top of the boat and had put it inside and just hoped for the best after that um but with that once we got evacuated though puerto rico they evacuated us on military planes and when we were leaving um to get evacuated they were like shuffling people out and we had with us we probably had about four between between the three of us we probably had about i would say six bags and that was just pretty much like our life in six bags what we had left of once they they had to do searches like hand searches because obviously the airport was completely devastated like we were standing in a parking lot the entire day they were putting other bags they're like okay which bag do you want to carry on and what what other ones are are, are gonna go and so you know we you know i chose my electronics christian grabbed his other bag and kyler did as well and then they, were, they started putting our other bags onto this like luggage cart and we kind of assumed okay they're gonna put our bags on the plane with us they actually we didn't get to keep our bags they left they didn't tell us that we weren't going to be allowed to have our bags that we weren't going to get our bags they just once we took off they're like yeah you guys aren't good 
your bags are in St. Martin Airport will let you know if you guys will get your bags back. So, Yikes. yeah, like we have so much. I would have, the thing that makes me so upset about that too is that if they would have just told me that we weren't going to be able to, we were only allowed one bag and that is it, I would have rearranged things. Like we left a couple of electronics behind, a couple of paperwork and things like that, which I would have put in another bag. Once we had got to Puerto Rico though, it wasn't just us that, that had happened to. We were talking to other people the entire time because they kind of, once we had got to Puerto Rico, they directed us to hotels to stay in. So a lot of the evacuee, evacuees were all staying in the same hotel. When we had got there, the people were even saying, this one lady, she said she had put, they, did, they didn't tell them either, and she put all her, her jewelry was in one of her other bags. She's like, if they would have told me, I would have taken my jewelry out. You know what I mean? And I talked to another gentleman who said he had about like $2,000 in cash in another bag because he thought he would be able to get that, you know, he had taken all his money out that he could and all this and that, and he had put it in one of his other bags. And they they didn't tell us. So my thing is they must have all this luggage just sitting there, and, and I'm really not surprised if it, if it hasn't been looted or anything like that because the people left so many valuables and things like that, which I know in the grand scheme of things, we are very grateful for our lives, and we are so happy that we are alive and here. You know what I mean? Like it's just material things at the end of the day. But it is it is still frustrating because that's all you have left is me and Christian are very lucky that we still have, you know, very supportive parents. I'm now moved back in with my my mother until further notice. But, you know, that was our life. That was our home. That was, you know, those were all our valuables. That's all we had. That's what we worked for. And to just kind of be left, they literally gave us an email address and said, email a description of your bag and we'll let you know what happens. And so, you know, but who's who knows to say, even if we get that luggage back, will it be in you know, a couple of years, if any, even if we do, and then if not, like, it, it, it just was, it's just very hard, because I, you can't be upset, but at the same time, you are, you know what I mean, like, once, like I said, once again, we're happy that we're alive, but, you know, those, those were your things, those were your valuables, you know, and I had to completely start over, like, I know it's not the end of the world, but, you know, you got to buy a whole new wardrobe, a whole new, you know, everything that you had, and your, all that, so I, the only bag I brought was, like I said, was my electronics, so I have, you know, all my, my camera equipment and my laptop. And, you know, it's okay, but it's just, I would have changed things around if I had that opportunity to move things around in, in, in our bags and stuff like that. And as well with that, they said that they were, we still haven't been charged yet, but we had to sign waivers saying that we have, we're going to get billed for our evacuated flight out of there as well. And they couldn't give us a price on how much that was going to cost. And that was kind of also kind of annoying because okay, I've just lost my boat, I pretty much don't have any money, and now you're going to tell me that you don't know how much this airplane ride in a military plane is going to cost on top of all of this? So that was also a bit nerve-wracking, but like I said before, you just got to go back to just, you know, the one thing that kept me getting through it, and I think Christian and Kyler was like, you know, it doesn't matter, we're alive, we're alive. You know, those material things, we'll figure out where we can get the money when we can get it, you know, we have a pulse and we're happy and we're smiling and that's all that matters but it, it was a it was a u.s government plane and it was uh, ah, someone ah. from the u.s military that was handling the bag situation yeah i believe so so it didn't seem like when we were there so the there was a bunch of different militaries from everywhere because saint martin is dutch and french so they had different militaries there i couldn't tell you who exactly but they, they were kind of more in control. I think that they didn't really want the U.S. military there at all. It was kind of like the U.S. said, well, we're going to get our citizens out no matter what, so we're going to land our planes. And they weren't letting any of the U.S. military even like to leave the airport. They were only allowed to stay on the tarmac. So I believe, yes, the U.S. military was in charge of all of that, but I just wish they would have just used more clarification on the words of, these bags are probably going to end up staying here. Take what you want. And we had gotten to the, to the airport at 6 in the morning on the day. On that Sunday, we, we went and we wanted to be the first ones in line to get out of there. So we went to the airport at 6 in the morning. The first U.S. plane didn't end up touching down until about 1.30. And then, so we were standing in line. And now once the U.S. and ambassadors, I believe that's the right word, showed up, they were like telling us, talking through us, you know, telling us about the paperwork, telling us that they were gonna have to, we were going to get charged, and that we had to sign a waiver and all this and that. 
I just thought there was ample amount of time to sit there and tell us, hey, only one bag is going to be allowed on this plane. People had been started been evacuated the day before us, so people were starting to get evacuated on Saturday before. They obviously, I felt like they probably already knew that that was going to happen. So why wouldn't you start giving you know warnings to people so they could just rearrange their luggage to just that one single bag that they were going to be able to carry on? I'm not quite sure. So also another thing was, so when we were leaving, we all did see a lot of people taking their pets with them. The next day, our friends that I was telling you about before, the ones they were staying at our hotel with, they flew out the following the following day, that Monday. That Monday, they weren't letting any animals on the plane at all. They said that they were literally, it was either you stay with your dog in St. Martin or you leave, like, your dog in the parking lot. There was no, it was, you know, oh you either goodness. take the dog or you don't. And you know what I mean? Like, it, and I, once again, you know, you have to think, okay, yes, your life is, somewhat more valuable but you know our pets become our families you know what I mean your dog is you know becomes you know your your child in a way um so I couldn't have imagined if we had had an animal with us and having to leave the animal you know you're just leaving the animal to its own defenses and so I thought that was completely cruel and sad because I just I couldn't imagine having to leave an animal but but once again at the end of the day you you got you know your life is a little bit more important so I think there's just always, you know, you could just go keep going back and forth. Hey, my life's more important than these these kind of things. But it, it it it's hard. It's definitely it's mentally hard. It's physically challenging, mentally challenging. You know what I mean? It, it, you you go through a lot, I guess. Well, I wouldn't leave daily under those circumstances. That's yeah, my but dog. you know, we, it, it's hard because what what are you gonna do? Are you gonna stay? You know, you're gonna stay in a place where. I'm um, in St. Martin. It was getting even worse with the the violence. You're going to stay around. There was a 24 hour curfew. You know the violence is terrible. There's hardly any food or water. So you know, where do you go? Do you stay with with your dog or do you do you leave your dog? You know. So and people were having to be put in those situations, and I just it, it was it really was devastating. It was completely heart wrenching and emotional and overall across the board intense. I guess. Do you know what branch of the military was the plane that you were on? What the, uh, I I have to look it up. I do. We brought some of our cards because we had sale um, like boat cards, and I had given one of our cards to one of the the guys who was working there, who work well, who works with them, and he actually messaged us and wanted to let us just check check in on us and said that it was great to have us on the flight. I don't even remember. It feels like so long ago now. Like after everything happens, you know, it feels it's so in the moment when everything's happening. But like even just you know, it's been two, three weeks now, and it just everything is. It still feels so like it. It feels like it hasn't happened. If that makes sense, like it felt like that was almost like a dream in a way or a nightmare, I should say. What are some of the things that you wanted to take off? You think that you should have taken off the boat, but you didn't. Um, there was a couple of things like we had some of our, like I had a life straw on the boat, didn't break. Uh, there was just like, like valuables, like mementos that I, I would have liked to bring, you know, would have brought, you know what I mean? Things that we had picked up on our journey, like, cause we had made it all the way from Grenada to, to St. Martin. And in that time, you know, we had gone to so many beautiful islands and, had gotten so many amazing like, souvenirs and mementos. So it was just more of those kind of things. We, I felt like safety wise, we did our, like the best we could. Like I definitely felt the most safe during the hurricane, like especially walking around like the hotel, like other people, obviously like we had these harnesses, we had like our, um, like, so we could clip on to each other. You know, we just, in safety wise, I felt like we, we were very more prepared just because we were coming from a boat. So that was amazing in that kind of sense of like feeling like the security of safety, but pretty much the things that I would have taken off, just like mementos and things like that. And I really didn't pack like after it had happened, I had only brought like, we had like, this is totally not really that much matter, but we had like a whole pile of laundry we had to do before we, like when we left the boat, we're like, oh, we'll do the laundry when we get back. Like once again, thinking we were going to be coming back to the boat, I ended up only bringing like a t-shirt and like one pair of pants and like I just didn't pack for several days 
that, you know, I didn't think we were going to be in that long haul of how long we were there for. And so clothing wise, didn't have the right things that you really needed afterwards. And it just, that kind of aspect of it, um, clothing mainly, and then just mementos that we just had gathered through our journey. And if I could have brought the boat into the hotel room, I would have brought the boat into the hotel room. Because <laughs> you just you just don't think that your boat's going to end up at the bottom of the lagoon, which really sucks. Tell me about Mischief. What kind of boat was it? She was a CSY 37. She was uh, built in 1978. She'd been completely redone. Her previous owner had completely gutted her and redid the interior. Different. It was a great couple's boat. I loved it. We had like a V-bird in the front. It was just beautiful. Wood floors and we had really, we had redone. We got new cushions in her. We had got, we had just got a rain catcher and then about a couple of months ago, we had, in May, we had got uh, new solar panels. So we had just become really self-sufficient on mischief, like 100%. You know, we were catching our own water, using just the, the sun for power. She was a great boat overall. She's a great learning boat, because we both, me and Christian, had never sailed when we decided that we were going to get a sailboat down in Grenada. It was kind of like, let's do something different. We had first thought about getting an RV and doing like, across the U.S., but we decided to go with a sailboat instead, and so learning on her was new, very different, like when I look back and think when we first got to Grenada and we started sailing on her, oh, I felt like we were pulling each other's hair out at times, because it's, it's kind of stressful when you're learning to sail, and you know, knowing the do's and the don'ts, and just like comparing to like right at the end before we had lost her, like our last sail that we had from, we had overnighted in St. Kitts and then did from St. Kitts all the way to St. Martin. It was a beautiful sail. We sailed on and off Anchorage completely by ourselves, no motor use. And we sailed the whole entire time. And it was, it was just gorgeous. You mean like there was no, we had become so comfortable with sailing and the experience, you know what I mean? I think you just feel so different when you, you feel so like you're doing this on your own, you know, you're not using any power or anything like that. You're, you're self-sufficient and it's one of the most amazing feelings. And, and that's what also kind of sucks just as we were really becoming, you know, good sailors and really starting to really enjoy it. You know, you're kind of like cut off short of it. So that kind of really, really, really sucks. What kind of upgrades did you do when you were in uh, Grenada? Um, we had done, so we put her out on the hard and we put completely, re, you know, sanded down the hull ourselves, painted the bottom, redid some of the teak, like the exterior on the teak. That was like our, the biggest projects there. Just uh, pretty much just more like, I guess I would say more like we gave her a facelift, if you'd put it in terms of that. Just getting her sailing re- ready. We got all our, we did redid know, took down all the rigging so we could figure out how to reassemble it, put it back together, made sure that everything was ready. Because like I said before, we both didn't have any sailing experience. So sailboats were completely new to us. So just learning the ins and outs of her. And just like, just like I said, pretty much just cosmetic things more. And then we just like slowly through the process, we had just bought, you know, things to add the solar panels, rain catchers, that kind of thing. We added a bimini cover to her, which is ex- exterior-wise. We put, just put so much work in, you know, everyday cleaning, washing. We completely, completely, like, redid the the top, uh, painted the top of her. And so that, that was also hard to just, you know, we put hours upon hours of work. But, you know, with anything, like, with any boat, though, it's always going to be continuous amount of hours and time and stuff like that. Why did you guys decide to buy Mischief? My dad, kind of what happened was, so I just graduated college in December and I wasn't ready for like the nine to five job. So that's how it kind of stumbled upon. So I was like throwing ideas back and forth with my dad. And he he was like, well, he was the one who kind of gave us the idea to do a sailboat. And he had a friend down in Grenada that had had a sailboat already down there. And so he gave us the idea of like, well, why don't we go look? So we had flown down there just to look and Pretty much the helping of my dad was really the one who kind of guided us towards mischief. We kind of fell in love with her. She was she has a great layout for the Caribbean. A lot of people told us, especially new sailors, if you're going to sail, the Caribbean is a 
right, you know, the wind is perfect most of the time. You know what I mean? Like once you pass a certain point, you know, you, you're going with the, the wind. So it's a good idea. We wanted to specifically find a boat in Grenada so we could sail it back to Florida because it's just the best sailing. And Mischief was there and she had been um, in Grenada for 14 years. She sat on the hard for about, I think it was like 10 of those years. And she actually was in Charlie when they got hit with Charlie down there. And her mast was snapped. This is when the previous owner had owned her. The mast was completely snapped during Charlie and he had re- redone everything. The previous owner really put a lot of love into her as well. Just remodeled her at that point as well. So she just needed to, she, the guy kind of had a really good price for us. He wanted to get rid of the boat and we thought, okay, this, this is it. You know, she's, she's a great, you know, she's not in bad conditions. He had just put a new mass on her. So the rigging was pretty much brand new. The sails had sat in an air conditioned, like an air conditioned place for the, the 10 years that it was. So pretty much like the sails were almost brand new as well. So we really got a good deal for her and a great looking boat. So that was kind of more of how we ended up with her. Do you mind saying how much you paid for her? No, 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 of course not. Um, so we got partial of it from as, as a graduation present was from my parents. They put some money towards it for us. But it was around 40000 So it wasn't terrible. We had been saving money up. Christian had been working for the last, uh, he was had a, det- has a, or had a detail business and just sold his detail business before we left. So we had been saving. We took out a couple of loans. So that's kind of also hard to go with all of that. But she was, she was an amazing boat overall and great price we bought her for. And we'd love to, I want to, we do eventually want to go dive back down on her just to see the damage. We haven't heard anything from the marina yet, which I'm going to assume we'll probably hear something from them shortly about getting her out of the water or the plans. Um, I've tried to reach out to them, but I think there's still not that great of communication out in St. Martin, but we'll just have to figure out. A lot of our followers have been saying, you know, they'd love to see if we could, you know, revive her. The thing with that though, you know, is it, you know, are you going to end up just putting more money into a boat versus putting all that money into a boat or just buying a new boat? You know what I mean? At that point, by the time that we would, you know, bring her back to life, do you just buy a new boat or do you put that money towards it? So that's also what is something that we're we're going back and forth with. Um, I guess just the big thing is just the circumstances. We really did have more of a plan before Maria hit, but now that Maria's hit and devastated Puerto Rico, leaving Christian completely stranded there currently, I don't, I don't really know what's going to happen now. We do for sure, though, know I, I want to go back to St. Martin. Um, our families are requesting us that we don't that we don't go during hurricane season. Once Christian comes back, it was kind of like, okay, we'll wait, just because this is this was the worst hurricane season in in years. You know what I mean? This is like I said, Irma was made history. She was one of the worst hurricanes in history, and and so I think you know just staying away from hurricane season is probably good. I think me and Christian definitely learned our lesson. Um, in all of it and after all of this just don't don't go sailing during hurricane season but even with that being said we're from florida and irma hit florida and devastated so many boats even in the keys and things like that so in retrospect even if we had a boat and we had made it back to florida our mischief still might not have made it here in florida you know what i mean i I think it that's also hard you know a lot of people are giving us a lot of like really like negative comments that we were silly for sailing during hurricane season. But even if we weren't and we were home with our boat in Florida, we still have a chance of getting our boat, you know, boat hit or destroyed and in a hurricane. You know what I mean? There was thousands of, well not thousands, hundreds of boats in Texas that were completely destroyed. You know what I mean? Hundreds of boats here in Florida after Irma. So, you know, you can't, I feel like personally, you can't live your life wondering what ifs. You know what I mean? You can't stop yourself from doing something just because it could happen. Because it could have happened here and it could have happened there. And you know what I mean? So you just don't know. You just it's it's all gambling. And it's fifty fifty. I hear you. Uh our home port is New Orleans, which is not safe from hurricanes either. Oh gosh, yeah. So you know what I mean? So even if you you know, you don't you really don't know, you know, you could just being at home and you think your boat's safe. So what you just stay at home, you know? It's it really is. I think it's all luck of the draw. If you're the if you're the boat that ends up getting 
damage. I think it's literally just by luck or faith or whatever you want to call it. You know, you, every I think most most boat owners or a lot of us, I would say, put a lot of effort in making sure their boat is tied down, you know, and things like this. And it's just, you know, you just got to say a little like, please, please, please make it, you know, when you walk away. And if you're lucky that it's there when you get back, you know, you're lucky. And if it's not, yeah, I just purely think it's all on luck. No matter, you know, you can do the extreme. You could wrap your boat in bubble wrap if you want to, you know what I mean? And you could still be the one that completely has the most damage done to their boat. Um, we had met the guy I told you, Jacob. He His boat was on the hard, and I felt so bad for him. His family, he has a wife and two kids. They had just bought an Emil, and um, he'd been redoing it. It had been on the hard for the last couple of months. And his family was supposed to be flying in that weekend prior to Irma hitting. But they said, okay, he told us that his family rescheduled to come on like the Thursday after all, all happened because they were going to be sailing, finally be leaving. His, he was on the hard, you know, on the stand where they say it's better to be. His boat got knocked over and completely destroyed. You know what I mean? So, like, you, you can't, you know, it's all a gamble. It's completely all a gamble. You don't know. And as long as I think long as you can say that you did your best on trying to make sure your boat was as safe as it could be that's all you can really do you know you can say I tried and and I don't think the way we tied it down I don't think it has anything to do with it you know what I mean we we got checked by the manager we had been asking our our neighbor or the people who were right next to us if what they thought you know what I mean and we did everything that we could that we possibly could and you know like I said it's all luck it's all did you guys have insurance we have insurance, but it doesn't cover in named storms. That's what you kind of figure a lot of, of too, is that, that, you know, I mean, especially during hurricane season, like, insurance is, aren't the best, especially, like, during, in the Caribbean during hurricane season. So we're pretty much going to get none of our money back on mischief at all, which is also really hard to, like, process. But, you know, we just, if we want it, we will do it again. You know what I mean? Like, that's, like our mentality, we will work for it. And now we have amazing followers who have been helping us even now, been giving us money and support. And that's absolutely amazing. And we just, I think we're going to keep, you know, building that up. We'll just go back to the, the grind of working and saving back money up. And hopefully we'll be able to get a new boat. We've been talking about maybe buying a boat though that is not as like ready and finished and just spending the next uh, like year or two redoing uh, doing our own work on the boat so just you know from top to bottom um just so we could money wise since we're not don't have we're not money savvy as we were when we started because we had all our savings now we're just going to buy you know like more of a bare boat for only a couple of a thousand dollars and then rebuild her slowly so financially we can you know it will help out better if that makes sense maybe you could tell me more about Christian and Kyler's situation in Puerto Rico. So where are they staying? They are staying, so um, like I said, one of our followers, Earl, his name's Earl, had reached out to us and said that they wanted, that if we wanted to, if the boys wanted to stay on his boat, he has a boat, I'm, cannot, I'm so sorry, I could not tell you the, the type of boat. He wanted to stay on the boat. This boat his boat has been sitting um, on a mooring ball for the last 10 years. The gentleman has a house in Puerto Rico, and so if the boys wanted to stay on the boat, and then I would fly out in a couple weeks' time to go sail back down to St. Martin. Well, once they realized that the hurricane was coming and it was going to be big, they put Earl's boat into the mangroves, and then they were going to go stay with Earl. So I guess at the last minute, they ended up staying with this gentleman, um, one of Earl's friends, John. And John has a wife and a, a, a toddler, I believe. Kyler, Christian, Earl, Earl's wife, and then the couple and their ch child were all in this one home. I guess it's a really safe home. It has, it's a concrete, like all the way around, concrete roof, concrete structure. Christian said that after the hurricane, the house they were in, though, did not get much damage. A couple of windows blew out, but that was about it. Lots of uh, trees where they're staying were completely down. They were so silly. They left the spot on the boat. He had told me that they were in a rush. So the four days after, before we were actually able to contact Christian, I hadn't heard from them, even a spot check, like a check-in we hadn't received. But once they got back to the boat, they were able to get the spot and, like, do a check-in. 
gentleman, you know, let us know that they were safe. But they, I guess, went, ended up going back to the gentleman John's house. I guess Earl went and checked on his house. And the thing that they're worried about is Earl hasn't come back, though, since then. Um, Earl and his wife left, and there's no, there's not really much communication at all on the island. As you, like, I can't call them or anything like that. And so they actually haven't heard from Earl. So the guy they originally came with or anything like that, they haven't heard from them. And this amazing guy, John, has literally let them into their his home and has just been letting them stay there. And they are using, I guess there's only one server, service provider in Puerto Rico currently that is working, um, like cell phone service provider, and that is John's neighbor. So with that, he told me the service is not that great. When I talked to him last night, it's very like like choppy, it's broken up, and they don't have a, they can't be on the phone for a very long time. He told me, and the gentleman is also, a, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if it's all, all the way correct, but he said like a sheriff or a deputy type deal. So he's been out working the entire day. So if they're able to call, it will only be at nighttime, generally after nine o'clock. And they still can't guarantee anything because the cell service, though, is just so spotty. Like, yes, they have service, but it's like in and out. So they don't even know if they will. But he said that the, the food and water is there. It's starting to get smaller and smaller. And that's what's mostly concerning me. Just because, you know, like I said, the, the, soonest, the soonest you can book a flight out is the 17th of October. So if the food and water supply is so short now, I can't imagine what it's going to be, you know what I mean, in a week's time. And where they're located, they ended up better off, like location-wise. They're like where they're around. The neighborhood that they're in uh, didn't um, sustain really harsh damage. A lot of trees down, power lines down kind of thing. But they're so secluded is the issue that it's going to take them, you know, in a normal car, if you were just driving there, it's two to three hours just to get there. And he says, if you could even just drive there in a straight shot now, it's, it's going to be at least five plus hours or longer. But now you also think, you know, there's no gas. You know what I mean? They're running out of gas and they're trying to use that for the generator versus, you know, so they can cook food over, you know, driving somewhere. And since they are so far out, there's not a lot of people, you know, like Red Cross or FEMA is not coming out to them because they're so far out. So I'm really worried about if they'll be able to get more supplies and water and food and things like that. And they have kind of given up on living on Earl's boat? They just don't know what to do now is the thing because they haven't spoken to Earl since since they went and checked on the boat the first time. So they went back because there's nothing really left. Um, The thing was they took, Earl had taken, he had the sails in the boat but they took the sails off the boat when the boys came and stayed on the boat so they would have room and they were at Earl's house they don't know like if they could get the sails somehow he said that they would just you know sail to either you could you could either sail you know to San Juan and get immediate help or even sail to you know a different location sail higher you know to the DA or whatever you know to another island pretty much so they're trying to find either to see if they can, they're still been trying to get in contact with Earl so they could even just sail down to San Juan because that would be, you know what I mean, pretty easy in retrospect versus like driving. The roads are completely, um, like one of the roads is just completely flooded. They can't even, you know, you can't even drive a car and it's almost impossible to walk. So their best bet is to sail. So they've been talking to different people, trying to talk to other sailors with the boats that are, still intact to see if they could, you know, sail out somewhere. So that's also the next step that they've been really trying to, to do. I've been, I don't know if you know the channel Sailing Doodles. Yeah. Um, they have a uh, they have a boat down in Puerto Rico currently. And I'm, a gentleman had reached out to me yesterday saying that Sailing Doodles has a boat down there and they're willing to, you know, work something out so the boys can maybe use it. But like I said, they can't get anywhere is the problem you know what i mean they're kind of stuck in their small little radius that they're in and they can't go very far is the issue so it's just kind of figuring out you know every day uh, we've been getting on the phone with different people the airports to see if they're going to be opened anytime soon or anything like that so even if they had made it to san juan 
there's thousands of people living in the airport currently, and the there's only two flights a day. My mother actually works for the airlines, and so she has has somewhat more of a know of what's kind of going on behind behind there. And but they're only they're sending um, two flights a day, and that's it. They are sending um, there's I think it's seven seven four sevens or something like that. The big airplanes they use to do like international flights, but that that's that's about it. That it's one flight, and then there are thousands of people in the airport. So you know what I mean. Are you going to be lucky to get on? And so now what you're weighing is, do you stay, the, do they stay where they're safe right now and have no, no uh, problems, you know, where they're, you know, no problems, if that's me being like, like in the sense of, you know, they still have some food and water, they're in a safer location with, you know, good people they're surrounded with currently. Do you, you know, go out and adventure to figure out if you can get somewhere and then if, you know, now if you do and you get stuck and in not a good situation, I mean, now you're opened up to all these, you know, living in an airport for for X amount of days or, you know, at least they have a bed and a roof over their head currently with the Johns family. So, you know, that, that's what they keep going back and forth with. You know, do you try or do you not? And I think, um, like, when we were in with Irma, like, my also my mentality – I believe this is Christian's mentality currently as well as you mean you until you know you are gonna more than likely get out of there and if you're in a safe situation where you're at currently, you know what I mean, bunker down there as long as you can, in a way. You know what I mean? If you can get help if you just don't know because they're just it really is hard to just know if they're gonna go out there with people looting and are they gonna have more food and water if they get to another location? Will there be anything? They currently have that. So do you leave that or do you try to test and go and explore? So it, it's really hard on, on, on that kind of sense. Is there anything that I should have asked you but I didn't ask you that you'd like to say? Just that don't forget about the people and the other parts of the Caribbean that have been completely devastated by Irma and some what of Maria now too. Um, I know we have a lot of attention on Puerto Rico, which yes, it needs it. I just that's the only thing I would have to reiterate that there needs help throughout the Caribbean. I think the Caribbean's going to need a lot of um, a lot of TLC after all this. A lot of people need to you know book those vacations afterwards. I know that sounds a little weird, but a lot of these islands require so much. You know, a lot of their their profit is from tourism, and you know the cruise ship terminal terminals are completely destroyed. The airports are completely destroyed. Hotels are not that great. I know you might not want to book a a vacation now, but booking vacations will help them get back on their feet. You know what I mean? And, you know, send money, donate money. If you have clothes, do it and just, just be prepared. Always be prepared. And if there's a hurricane, buck her down. You know what I mean? Either get out, fly away, sail away. Make sure you're prepared. But that's probably about it. Thank you for speaking to me. And I'm really sorry about your loss. You're back in Florida. I think that was a great decision on your part. <laughs> I'm sure you'll you'll bounce back and you'll find uh, other things. And it sounds like you're a really smart lady and uh, yeah, resourceful. Motivated. Well, thank okay. you, Ariana. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'll be listening to your podcast for sure. Okay. okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take a moment to subscribe to Slow Boat Sailing and hit the bell notification icon so you don't miss our videos of the most interesting sailors in the world and ripped from the headline stories. Global Sailing, we're also sailing around the world part-time, and we've sailed through the Panama Canal across the Pacific to the Kingdom of Tonga. Plan to sail beyond there in future years. Stay safe and stay dry. I'm Linus Wilson. Bye-bye. Subscribe to Slow Boat Sailing. Hit the bell notification icon so you don't miss a video. We feature the stories of the most interesting sailors of the world, ripped from the headline stories of sailing disasters and our round the world sailing adventure, where we go from New Orleans through the Panama Canal and across the Pacific. Mantis aimed to design the most reliable anchor ever made. 
Other anchors often cannot set in firm or grassy bottoms, endangering your safety. The mantis frequently sets the first time even in the most demanding situations. We sleep a lot easier using the mantis anchor as our primary on the slow boat. Get yours at mantisanchors.com or other fine retailers.